Hello, and welcome to Ram Country. I'm your host, Dave Willauer, and it's always my pleasure to bring you some of the great things that are happening across the Spring Ford Area School District. Today, we talk with teacher Vince Randall. Vince has been a part of the Spring Ford family for 13 years, having taught first through fourth grades. Currently, he's a first grade teacher at Limerick Elementary School. But Vince has an interest in something that has taken him many places and has afforded him the opportunity to meet some interesting and unique people. So Vince, welcome to Ram Country, first Thank of you, all. Thank you, Dave. Great to have you here. Great to be here. And that something that we're talking about is animation. Absolutely. And you've had a really a lifelong interest in the art of animation, correct? From the time I remember going to the movies for the first time, absolutely. Yep. Before we start to talk about that, tell us a little bit about your background. You're, you're from this, this area, right? I'm from Pottstown. Uh, I went to the Pottstown School District, graduated through that school district, and um, went on to Westchester University. I knew from the time I was young I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, my uh, teachers in elementary school all the way up just were a huge influence on me. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I pursued that and went to Westchester. Now, initially, um, you wanted to be a high school teacher, though, right? That is true. Yeah, uh, teaching history in high school was an initial interest. But then I started working at a daycare at 18. And the little kids, they were just so much fun. I mean, you talk about the spark of imagination. It comes from a child. Mm. It doesn't get any better than that. So that's when my direction went a different path. Now, what brought you to Springford? Uh, what brought me to Springford was student teaching. Mm -hmm. I, uh, through Westchester, I had the privilege of actually working under you, Dave, at Royersford. That's right. And you have um, Mrs. Uh, Marionetta Lair, Marionetta Kubaki was your, was your uh, cooperating teacher, I believe, right? Yes, yeah, she was, uh, second grade. And uh, I was lucky to actually come in as a student teacher in the fall rather than the spring. That's a great Starting time to all do it. fresh with the kids and Marionetta mm. to this day continues to be my number yeah. one role model when it comes to teaching. Yeah, she's great. She that, is great. That's for sure. She now, you, you've taken animation and you've brought that into the classroom, though, in, in a number of different ways, right? Absolutely. Well, any chance I get to, to enter, to inject that into the classroom, I do. And the kids, I mean, you say Disney or animation cartoons, you have their attention right then and there. Um, but we have the Cool School program right. through spring summertime, forward, right. in the summer. And that allows teachers the opportunity to really share with students things that they're interested in and to get the students excited about it. So there were quite a few years there where I taught a Disney course. And we ran the gamut of learning about Walt Disney and the kids actually realizing that Walt Disney was a real, real man. <laughs> it's not just a name. Yeah. So they were fascinated by that. We did little things with animation, flip books, and. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a real privilege to uh, be able to bring that to the school district yeah. in the summertime. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about how you became interested in animation as a, as a young kid. Well, I think like anyone else, I, I think if you talk to anyone and you ask them your favorite Disney movie, right off the bat, they can tell you. Uh, for me, my earliest memory um, was actually seeing Cinderella, and it was at the Coventry Mall when they used to have a movie theater inside that mall, which is now the food court. And um, I just, I remember the scene where the stepsisters are really bullying Cinderella, they tear her dress apart, and I remember feeling as a child very angered by that. Mm. And right then and there, as a young child, and I even think even into an adulthood, it's very easy to be convinced that these are living and breathing that, characters, that real life. That emotion, that was, emotion was transmitted. Right. Yeah, right. And uh, that's what Disney excelled in. But anyway, that was my earliest memory. And then um, the ending um, of Sleeping Beauty, when Maleficent, the evil fairy, transforms into this dragon. I mean, that was just the coolest thing to see the prince fight this dragon where the castle's you know, just enshrined yeah. with thorns. Yes, and you know, yes, it was yeah. just so epic. Um, so that's really where the spark happened. But from a young age, I always wanted to know more. It wasn't just good enough to watch the film. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how these cartoons were made. Oh, you wanted what? to know how they actually came to life, in other words. Exactly, okay. right. exactly. So, um, 
on up through, I mean, I watched every Disney movie imaginable, and as I got into adulthood and realized that there were actually books and documentaries and with now the internet, I mean, it's all at your fingertips now. Mm -hmm. So I was very much interested in the behind the scenes. Awesome. So uh, your parents supported that as well too, right? Absolutely. Um, both my mom and dad are lovers of film and music. And my dad and my mom both have very fond memories of watching Walt Disney back in the 50s and in my mom's case, the 60s when it was in color on television. Um, you could tell, I think like any parent, they can't wait to show them that first Disney film. And they were more than generous with providing me opportunities to watch and talk about them and enjoy the music. And to this day, my dad still gets choked up when he hears when you wish upon a star. <laughs> Is that right? So, yeah, um, yeah it, it's, you know, the um, roots run deep, thanks mm -hmm. to my parents. So tell us a little bit about some of the, the really the research, the exploring that you've done to uh, get behind the scenes, really, to, to discover how that all happens, how the magic happens. Yeah, well, I mean, it started um, thanks to, like, DVD and Blu-ray. There's a you know, a plethora of uh, special features. So that enticed me, but books. Mm -hmm. um, there was one uh, book that I picked up that I actually uh, have right here by um, animation historian John Canemaker. And he's also a professor of animation at NYU. Um, he's, you know, he was, uh, played a huge role in getting the animation department started there. But I read this book here, it's called Before the Animation Begins. And it's about the art and lives of Disney sketch artists. And it's very easy to assume that when you watch a Disney film that it was all done by Walt Disney. And through the 50s and even through the 60s, that's pretty much the picture it painted. But mm -hmm. there were hundreds of talented artists that worked for Disney. And I wanted to know more about them to start to peel mm -hmm. away the layers. And that's exactly what people like John K. Maker, what they do, what uh -huh. they've done. Now, largely, those artists were uncredited, though, right? Yes. Um, I mean, if, unless you were like, you, if you worked on a particular part of the film or a bulk of the film a lot, whether you were a director or what we call a supervising animator, okay, um, then you got credit. But most of these men and women did not. Mm. Did not. Now, Disney did not just hire people who could draw cartoons. Right. Right. I mean, what was his process, his thought process for who he employed? Well, what was really unique about Walt Disney is he wanted to take animation in a new direction by incorporating fine art. Mm -hmm. So during the 1930s, especially during the Depression, the Disney studio was still making money. But these artists who were trained to be fine artists could not find work. So it led them right to Walt Disney. And the quality of work, the training that these artists had through schoolings and traveling abroad is exactly the type of expertise he wanted put into his animated cartoons. A little bit of serendipity taking place there, right? Just because of the, the life and times of the nation with the Absolutely. depression, these artists were available. These artists were available and they were looking for work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big reason why they ended up at the Walt Disney Studio. Well, tell me, what else did uh, John uh, Canemaker tell you about the process? What are some of the things that you learned by his book? And you also met him. Correct? Yes. Yeah. John, um, John Canemaker, um, after I read this book, it just moved me in such a way because this is exactly what I wanted to know. This was the exact type of information I was looking for. And this is just one of his books. There are others, but this started it all. So I felt compelled to write him. And uh, he's a teacher and he works at NYU. And I uh, found his email address and sent him an email just to thank him and to continue his work. And this is something that I would love to be a part of someday. He wrote me back and he pretty much said, if you're ever in the New York area, let me know. And we can meet for lunch and we can talk about animation. And that's exactly what happened eight wow. years ago. That's unbelievable. We're going to take a quick break. Sure. And when we come back, we're going to find out about that meeting that you had with John K. Maker. Sounds great. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Lore of Ram Country. 
Sometimes, the things we do or say can make others feel hurt, excluded, or isolated. Everything you say and do creates an impact. How am I supposed to save the whole world? You can't think about saving the world. You have to think about saving one person. Because of you, someone's entire life can change. You don't have to be a superhero to have a positive impact. Friends? Friends. Welcome back to Ram Country. We're talking with first grade teacher Vince Randall about his lifelong interest on the topic of animation. And Vince, before the, the break, we were talking about you're reading this book by John Canemaker and uh, contacting him by email mm -hmm. and getting an invitation from yeah, him. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And uh, I emailed him back and I happened to have off that President's Day and it just took the train up to New York. and. I have to admit, looking back, I was a little starstruck. I wish I could do it over again and you know, not be so overwhelmed, but he was so gracious with his time. And I, you know, we enjoyed the lunch and um, yeah, we talked about basically our love for animation. Um, so yeah, and John's an Oscar winner of an animated short that he did back in 05. You got to hold the Oscar. I got to hold the yeah, Oscar, yeah, yeah which pretty was, was awesome. pretty cool. Yes, it was yeah. very nice of him to allow that. He signed this book for me. Um, so yeah, with this book, like I said, it focused on those artists that helped bring Walt Disney's vision of a story to life. And without these artists, it could not have been done. Wow. Now, I've heard the term, the nine old men. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what that is? I mean, that's always been connected to the, the Disney Animation Studio. Mm -hmm. what, what was that all about? Well, it became, I guess, more or less of a I don't know, like an inside joke within the studio, but Walt Disney had a group of premier animators that were supervising animators that would create these characters and the animation of these characters, and then they had other animators that worked under them. But these cluster of animators happened to be all men. There were nine of them, and Walt, um, from what I understand, Chris and them with the oh, name. The he nine gave old, them the name. Okay. The, the, nine, uh -huh. the nine old men of animation. Yes. <laughs> How about yeah. that? And they were the ones who originally worked on Snow White? or. Um, well, when I think about it, maybe not all of them did. I mean, some of them were there a little earlier than others, but they certainly came in. I think um, Les Clark was the first of his animators. He was with Walt, if I'm not mistaken, around the late 20s. Okay. But others trickled in into the mid 30s when he started to really take things ahead with Snow White, which came out in 37. Um, but all of them were definitely there by the late 30s. Okay, all right. Um, but there were still hundreds of other artists that were Oh, absolutely, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for just one of those animators, I mean, there were uh, numerous others that worked on their crew, mm -hmm. uh, their animation unit. They were assigned to a character. So let's take one of the nine old men. His name was Ward Kimball. And if you all are familiar with Pinocchio, there was a character called Jiminy Cricket. And Ward Kimball was assigned to creating the animation of Jiminy Cricket, the style, the feel. And he created that animation. But he also had to show the other animators that worked on his unit that he was assigned to how to draw the cricket and how the cricket should move and from different angles. He so, was almost like a guardian of, absolutely. of that character. Absolutely. And each of these, and primarily it was these nine old men of animation, um, they were assigned to a character and then they had animators that worked under them. Mm -hmm. Now, I, there's also a story I've heard that, that Walt met with the crew uh, in the development of Snow White and he acted out the whole thing. Yeah. Did all the voices, all the characters. It, have you come across any of that? Absolutely. And when they say Disney was the ultimate storyteller, um, the, the words have never been truer. Walt Disney invested so much time into the stories that he chose that he thought were appropriate to turn into film. And yes, he did act out. He, he would stand up there and the animators, when you watch these documentaries and you read these books, they were just in all of him. I mean, they were just completely captured. He was Snow White, he would act out the witch. He would act out the prince. He would act out Snow White, the dwarfs. I mean, it was just, 
He knew. He saw it in his head. He knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. And yep. he, he was a, a tough boss, too. He was tough. He was tough. And with Walt, he didn't rush things. He knew in the early 30s and late 20s that his animators were not ready to tackle something like Snow White with human locomotion. Um, so he used his cartoons building up to then, like the Mickey Mouse cartoons. He had a series of cartoons called the um, Silly Symphony mm -hmm. cartoons, yeah. which were very much based on music. It was a cartoon supported by music with very little dialogue and um, actually hardly any dialogue at all. And he used them as practice. He had um, professionals come in. He took his animators back to school. They would bring animals right on the set, you know, where they could study these animals and learn and from them. And their movement. And their movement, okay. yes. Uh -huh. I mean, he would drive his artists to these schools if they didn't have cars. I wow. mean, he was completely invested. Wanted the best for them. And then when he thought they got to the point where he thought he was ready to tackle that first um, feature length, over an hour long animated feature, then he did it. And, and this was, it was brand new. I mean, there was nothing like this ever created before, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Snow White started it all mm. in terms of feature length animation, yes. And, and the premiere brought people to tears. Absolutely. I mean, there were major celebrities that um, were moved by it. I mean, the animators were there. None of these celebrities knew who these animators were, but they were there at the premiere and they heard big time celebrities just weeping. Wow. I mean, they bought into the fact that, are we gonna lose Snow White? You know, <laughs> will the prince, you know, will she ever awaken again? Wow. So they bought into it and... Ultimate tribute, really, when you think about it though. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the animators were in awe, they couldn't believe it. Mm. But they knew they, they knew that they had done something pretty special. Yeah. Now, uh, the idea of a storyboard, mm -hmm. that was also something that was developed or invented out of necessity or whatever by Disney? Absolutely, and if you go back to the one of the very first Mickey Mouse cartoons, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon was sound was Steamboat Willie. Right. So we're talking 1928, and that was all storyboarded by Walt Disney himself. Maybe we should explain what a storyboard is. Yeah, I mean, think of it like a comic strip. Mm -hmm. Instead okay, of that's a writing good out, yeah, instead of writing out a novel or sitting down and writing the story, they told the story with pictures. Mm -hmm. So they were like comic strip. Here's Mickey in the boat. Here's Mickey tugging the whistle. Mm -hmm. Here's Big Bad Pete, the enemy, yes. coming right. up behind him, right, you know. Right. It was all done with pictures with narrative on the side. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, and Walt Disney did that himself. And then they had to fill in those frames. Mm -hmm. The animation went between those, right? Right, and yeah, what was really... The, the missing blanks. Absolutely, and, and, and as this storyboard process evolved, the animators had a ball with it. Or more or less, I should say, at the time they were called story men because the studio was... Mm -hmm ran primarily by men at the yes, time. That's right. just you know how it was at the time. And um, these storyboard artists who drew these storyboards, not only did they draw these pictures, but everyone sat in a room and they had to act the scene out. Oh, is that so right? So guys were jumping, they were hooting, they were hollering. I mean, they, it was just, it was a performance yeah. to sell to Walt Disney, this is what we wanted to do. How about that? Yeah. Interesting. Now, uh, you're, you're meeting with John, Mm -hmm. also created some interest in one of the artists who worked for Disney that you became very well acquainted with. Absolutely. I mean, John led me in the direction. I knew where to find reliable information through his right. books and then other notable historians. And um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to take another quick break. Okay, sure. And then when we come back, we'll be talking more with Vince Randall about the background artist that Vince actually got to meet and uh, interact with. Stay tuned. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Give your town a reason to celebrate. Because every Goodwill item you bring home brings job training and more to your community. 
Goodwill, bring good home. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Vince Randall about his lifelong interest in animation. And Vince, uh, right before the break, we were uh, talking about your meeting with John Canemaker mm -hmm. up in, in New York, and uh, you became, uh, you found out about? Was that the first time you found out about this artist? It was this book that led me in the okay. direction. All right. There was a particular artist in here named Dick Kelsey uh -huh. who did storyboard art, concept art, and concept art is just getting people excited about the direction we can go with color and staging. This particular artist named Dick Kelsey, I ended up writing an essay about that was published, which I was really proud of because it was my chance to take my love and just contribute to the history in some way. Sure. But I found out that Dick Kelsey had, I guess, what we would call a student or someone who learned from Dick Kelsey in the, in the 60s that was much younger than him. And that artist was Ron Diaz. And Ron was a background artist, and he was pinnacle in helping me finish the essay on Dick Kelsey, his mentor. And when Ron and I talked about Kelsey, I became interested in Ron. So one phone call led to another, led to another, and then I realized I wanted to know more about Ron and his history in animation and his love of art. And, you know, it really blossomed into a great long distance relationship over the phone. And you had a friendship from, from that moment on yeah. until he passed away. Yes, yeah. yes, he passed away uh, five years ago. Uh -huh. So I got to know Ron really well between 2010, 2013. And uh, it was Kelsey's art in this book that led me to Ron. And Ron has, he has come up in my life several times even since his passing. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah. and he, he was an interesting guy, too. I mean, tell us a little bit about his life story, because he was a kid growing up in Honolulu, right? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And to Ron, I mean, he was very much interested. I mean, Ron was interested in a lot of things, art, singing, um, plays. But he knew by the, when, when he saw Snow White as a kid, when it was re released, he was six years old, um, he was born the year Snow White came out, which was pretty cool. That he would is, always talk cool, about that. Yeah. But he knew he wanted to work for Disney someday. And how, how old was he when he came to that realization? Uh, I would say in his teens, especially okay. in high school. Mm -hmm. um, he actually would write the studio. What do I have to do to get in? Wow. Um, so when he was in high school, Dave, I mean, he was not only doing art classes in high school and his regular studies, he was actually doing, um, he was studying at the Honolulu Academy of Arts at the same time. And then in addition to that, he was doing long distance classes. So to briefly explain that, imagine that I gave you homework as an artist, but I'm in Maine and you're in Hawaii. So Ron signed up for this course and he would get his assignment in the mail and he would create this piece of art and he would mail it out back east here. Wow. And the cool thing is one of his teachers at the time, grading his work was none other than Norman Rockwell. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. So he got a lot of great feedback. Um, and that work got him interested in art commercially, magazine covers, things like that. He, was, he found that very appealing. So that kind of took his studies in a whole new direction in applying fine art to commercial art, mm -hmm. advertising and things like that. Um, but he still knew he wanted to work for Disney. So he kept applying and he kept applying. He put a portfolio together, and at the same time, when he turned 18, he was about to graduate from high school, his art teacher, who he was very fond of, gave his class an assignment, and it was to design a stamp for the United States Postal Service. It was a national contest. Oh, for this was students. a contest. Okay. It was a art. contest, uh -huh. yeah. So his art teacher in high school told him about it, and Ron said, okay, well, what's the theme? And it had, had to do something with world peace and unity, so he decided, I'll design a friendship stamp. He never thought he was going to win. He designed it, and it was sent out. At the very same time, he wanted to leave his island, travel across to Burbank, California, which is exactly what he did. And with him, he took his first portfolio. He took it to the Disney studio. He presented it to him, and you won't believe what they said to him. Oh, this, this is nice, Mr. Diaz, but this is too Disney. Too Disney. Too Disney. <laughs> we don't want, we do this. 
This is what we do. We want to see what you can do. Now, does that harken back to the, the wanting to hire fine artists and artists who had other abilities? Yes, okay. I truly believe that, absolutely. Okay. They were looking, you know, what can you do? You know, we'll get you to that point if you get here. Mm -hmm. So Ron, he's 18, he's in Burbank. By himself. He was by alone. himself. His yeah. family wasn't over yet. Um, he's working at a motel, which was very close to major Hollywood studios at the time, Warner Brothers and all that. So he got to visit the sets and things like that. You know, back then you could sneak a peek through picket <laughs> fences, right, at, right, you know, right. at sets and things like that. So he earned his keep by cleaning dishes, doing motel work and all that while he was preparing a second portfolio. So he basically had to start from scratch. He had to start from scratch. To show the Disney people what he could do. Absolutely, and as Ron put it, he worked like a madman. Because I, I know he was creating art on the spot just to put into that portfolio to take the Disney's. But then something happened before he could even get that second portfolio to him. Disney said, we'll see you another time, come back. Ron got a knock on the door one night in the motel room that he was staying at, the motel he was working at. And he opened up the door and cameras are flashing. The media was there. It was like the paparazzi of the 1950s. <laughs> and he's like, what's going on? And they said, congratulations, you won this national stamp oh, contest. That right? wow. Yeah, so he was just like, how did a kid like me from Hawaii win this contest? I mean, he completely forgot about it. But it was winning that contest that got him to Disney. How about that? Yeah. Wow. That, that's just unbelievable. So they actually became interested in him because of the notoriety Absolutely. from winning the contest. Absolutely. And Ron truly believed that he's sure that Walt Disney must have saw this because it was national attention. And that may have had a... The stamp, no doubt, played a huge role in him getting into the studio. So was he hired at that point? He was hired. Him, as an 18-year-old? He was 18 years old, going on 19, and um, he was hired at the Disney studio. Now, we have a picture of uh, a lot of the animators, and you can really pick Ron out in that picture. Absolutely. I mean, you can tell he's a young kid. Right. In the midst of all these older guys. Yeah, and that was taken in the 90s, much years later that you see. But when the 90s, they had a reunion of many of these animators and artists, you see Ron Diaz sitting there, and it's, <laughs> he's the youngest guy yeah. in the crew. And that was early 90s, I would say. Okay. Um, but what was really funny with Ron, when he found out about the stamp contest before the Postmaster General could call him. Oh. <laughs> so the Postmaster General called him the next day, and he says, you won? He's like, yeah, I already know. <laughs> the media told me. And then he got a call from Disney. Wow. So, I mean, could you imagine? No. Now, Could you not, imagine? As an 18-year-old, I can't. Right. We're going to have to stop for now. Okay. But there's a lot more to talk about. Would you be willing to come back and, and uh, spend another a segment of Ram Country talking more about Ron and his, his art? I would love to. All right. I would love to. Just give us a little bit of a teaser uh, as far as some of the films that he worked on, some of the well-known ones that our viewers would recognize. Well, in terms of Disney, his first film that he worked on was Sleeping Beauty. So we're talking, that was released in 1958, 1959. And that's the one that create, started to create your interest in animation, right? When I talk about... Or was that Mal Cinderella? No, nah, well, <laughs> when Maleficent transforms yes, into yes. that dragon. Okay. Yeah. So Ron Diaz was with me even as a little kid without wow. my even knowing it. Wow. And then he had a prolific career up, up until... Really, he died, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I mean, he bounced from studio to studio, and not just Disney. In fact, Disney, it, not so much Disney, but other studies, uh, studios, especially uh, Hanna-Barbera. Well, and I know everybody's going to recognize those, those films, too. So, absolutely. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, spending another segment talking more about Ron Diaz and, and some of the experiences that you've had with him. So, that would be my privilege. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you. Well, thanks for watching. As I said, uh, we'll be spending another segment in the near future talking with Vince Moore about the art of animation and his special relationship with Ron Diaz. For RCTV, this is Dave Willauer saying, make it a great day or not, the choice is yours. <laughs>